I 100% believe in extraterrestrials. There is no doubt. Anyone who doesn't think that there isn't life somewhere else in the universe is at this point, it's a really hard argument to make. I mean, the data just shows that there are Earth-like planets. I, I have a, a sort of a hard time believing that they're here or they've been here and they're just kind of hiding. And be, Because in order to do that, you not only have to not blow yourselves up and become so advanced that you can create some sort of technology that is way ahead of where we are to create faster than light travel. And then I feel like if you pull that off and you're going to go all the way across the universe... You're going to go and like not hide. You're going to be like, what's up? We're here. We did it. I don't buy this whole, they're, 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 they're all sneaky. Why are they sneaky? I'm Dan Patrick. This is the Pretty Intense Podcast. Uh, today on the show is Josh Gates. He is a television host and producer. He has a show called Expedition Unknown that's on Discovery. And he also has a new show called Josh Gates Tonight. And that is how I met him. I went on his show. We had a fascinating conversation. And of course, I just love traveling and I love ancient civilizations and I, I just love learning. So he had so much information because he's been to so many amazing places in the world and um, found out that his background is in two crazy things. He went to school for archaeology and drama and I was like well dude you have the perfect job you're on TV discovering artifacts and learning about you know the ancient meaning and significance of all of these crazy things like mummies and you know tablets and um, ancient sites and, and so he really does have the perfect job he's also a Leo and you learn that really early too and they're usually on TV so we just had a blast we talked about Egypt. We talked about um, the Mayan culture and civilizations and about pyramids. Um, we talked about uh, extraterrestrials and perhaps their interaction, uh, whether or not he believes in them. Uh, we also talked about uh, the paranormal. Um, and then he told some crazy stories of some things that he's experienced in his life that are like out there and like wild and make you really think. Yeah, it was just a really, really fun, super flowy conversation with lots of great stories. And I have uh, a lot of confidence that there's going to be a lot of you out there that hear this and then you might be wanting to tune into Expedition Unknown or his show tonight as he's just a fascinating guy with lots of great information. So uh, if you like the episode, please make sure you hit subscribe and the bell for notifications when we have a new episode come out. Uh, I love doing this. I really, really, really love podcasting. So just let me know in the comments what you liked so that we can make more of it and keep you all entertained. In the meantime, enjoy today. I got to tell you, I took a vacation this summer for the first time in like literally like 10 years. So I have, by the way, that would freak people out that you said that because you're always traveling. I know. So, okay. So I'm coming up on the end of three weeks at my parents' house in Massachusetts with my kids. And it has been blissful and also extremely tiring. Children are (laughs) Uh, like the greatest adventure. So, uh, but it has been so great to like take a little break. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get, I've been in Indiana with my parents actually staying with my parents for seriously like, two months. It's so hot in Arizona where I live. So I yeah. just got to get out of there and I have yeah. two dogs. And so it's way too hot in Arizona for my dogs. So yeah, I've been shacking up with my parents for two months. They're uh, I, maybe they're ready to get rid of me. I don't know. Maybe they maybe they're used to me there now. But um, but there's something about parents, you know. Yeah, it's like there's something amazing about going home and you feel like a kid again, and you also feel like a kid again in that you're still annoyed by your folks and they're annoyed by you, and everyone's like up in each other's grill every day, and it's hilarious. It's amazing. It's like I feel like I'm. I'm 44 years old and I'm also in high school right now at home with my folks. What do they do that you love though? I just love their routine. Like my dad gets up every day at like 445 in the morning for no reason. Like he has nowhere to be. He has nothing to do. It's like dad (laughs) thing. He gets up. He has this old pickup truck. He goes downtown. He hangs out with a, a bunch of other guys who get up way too early. They sit down at the dock downtown in their little seaside town. Talk about God knows what, you know, solve the world's problems. He goes to Dunkin' Donuts. He comes back with some munchkins for the kids. You know, my mom is like a professional sunbather at this point. She just sits out and tans and wears a big funny pink hat. I just love it. Like they have like, this 
this is their work life now. They 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 have to clock in every day for this hilarious routine. Okay, that's that's great. I do, I agree. My, my parents have the same thing. You know, they're in their you know early mid sixties, and my dad still works, and my dad. My mom kind of works. She helps them out, but she really watches my sister's kids a couple days a week. And like, they just have their things, you know, they're, they're again, the same thing. They're up at six for no reason. Right. And they're making coffee. And, you know, I could hear that because it's not that big of a house. And so, you know, right. I can hear the coffee machine go off and it's, there's something really familiar about it. And then of course, when I'm gone, I come back to my clothes being washed and folded and on the bed, yes. which is just magic because I, the, just, the best benefit of coming home, the laundry. Oh service. man. It's the oh. best. And, and, and so it's really fun. Oh, hi, bud. Hey, oh, look at this pork. Hi. What's with the cone? We've got a dog oh, here. Who's oh, a God. eating your shirt and B <laughs> has a cone on. It's like Doug from up. What, why does your dog have a cone? Actually, all? this is my sister's dog. And I think that, um, dear Sonny got fixed. And so, oh. you know, he doesn't have tough balls break. to lick, but he, he really can't be licking near where they were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tough break, buddy. Tough break. You'll yeah. This is, but this is how it goes. Like, I am certain that at some point in this interview, my two children will walk into this room, like pantless, you know, like holding a kitchen knife. Like it's mayhem. I, it's, oh it's, it'll God. happen. Yeah. So, okay. So you got three weeks off for the first time, like ever. Um, yeah. And of course, I guess there's a twist on your um, vacation. It's that most people think of vacation. And they think I'm going somewhere. And you did kind of go somewhere, but you didn't really take a trip necessarily to adventure. Right. It's really like an adventure into yourself. It is true. Like people always say, like, where do you want to go on vacation? I mean, my 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 stock answer is I just love Southeast Asia. Like I have a thing for Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand. Like if I was going to snap my fingers and go somewhere, I would I would go to that part of the world probably. And that's different for everybody. You just have those places you go to yeah, where you, where you feel, feel like. Home. Yeah, you're just like, oh man, what if I just like sold everything and moved here? And you have these fantasies of like, what if I lived here? You know, Italy's like that for me too. Like I could, I could, you know, move to Italy tomorrow. Maybe not right now because it's a million degrees there. But, um, but no, mostly when I have a vacation, I just want to stop moving right now. Like, you know, I I need to, um, to just be still and be in one place. That doesn't last too long. Like if I'm anywhere for like a month, I get a little antsy. I want to start travel. I start looking at, you know, travel websites and stuff, but, but yeah, it's a, a vacation for me is not going anywhere right now. I'm wondering if you still travel as much as you used to. I mean, you know, I'm sure back in the day, I think you said, you know, you traveled like 200, 250 days a year. Is yeah. it still like that? It is. No COVID really. threw a monkey wrench on everything, but I mean, is yeah. It so like COVID changed everything for about a year and a half for me. I mean, I went sure. from traveling you know, all the time to not traveling at all, like, like everybody. Um, but I was really fortunate. I, I kept working during that time. I started doing a talk show for discovery. We started kind of limping out and doing some domestic episodes of expedition unknown the, the main show that I make for them. And so we're back now to traveling and yeah, my schedule's still pretty much full tilt. Like I, I travel between 200 and 250 days a year. Uh, I won't do that forever, but, uh, you know, making my show, it's just kind of like we we have not been able to figure out a way to make it quicker because the show is about going to far flung places and going to remote archaeological sites and and having a real adventure and so you just can't do that in a few days and we make quite a lot of episodes of it a year so it's just one of those things that no matter how you paper it out it's just a lot of days abroad so you know there there are days when um it's like any job, you know, like people always say to me, oh, you, you have the best job in the world. I, I hear that line a lot. And I agree with them. Like, I can't argue with that. Like, it is such a privilege to be able to travel, you know, um, no doubt about it. But it is a lot of nights in weird hotel rooms and jungle huts and swatting mosquitoes away. So, you know, it's one of those, like, be careful what you wish for jobs. So, yeah, it's still it's still 200 plus days a year. I still love it. Uh, but it is. I do have to kind of wake up sometimes and do that affirmation thing of like, remember how rare and special this is and enjoy this because, you know, uh, it'll all be gone uh, at, at some point. Right. And so just soak it in. Yeah. Smart, smart. It's, it's hard in the moment to 
be able to step back and have that perspective and take it in at the same time. Because totally. like you said, like, you, you know, when you go on location and you have to, you know, do a bunch of voiceovers, or you have to do a bunch of, you know, sort of like B-roll pieces or, you know, certain clips and things that they need for it. It's like, it becomes work. You know, it's not just a totally. flow. It's not like they're just filming you running around. There's a lot of stuff that goes into having to make like a show. And so it becomes a little bit more work and it's not always the most glamorous. I'm sure as you're all over the world in these unique places, it's not like you're like, I so think people I think it is right. Like the minute you're like, I'm a travel host adventure guy. They're like, Oh, it must at, be so They think you're at glamorous. like the boutique hotels no, of the world. Never. You're... I'm like never at the ritzy places. I'm always in some tumble down because I'm out with these archeologists at these, at these dig sites and stuff. Like every once in a while I'm in a capital city and we, you know, it's, I have an okay hotel, but it's like, Sometimes I turn on Travel Channel or something, and there'll be a rerun of like World's Greatest Pools, and I'm like, "How do you get that job?" I'll host that show, you know, there is a better no, job I'm, than what you have. Oh, I mean, in terms of accommodations, for sure. My 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 job is not winning the accommodations war. For yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. I'm really curious because you're so smart and you sound like you just know your shit. Do you have an archaeology archaeology background? Do you have a uh, science and research kind of background, um, biology, like it's so I have a weird background. Like I, I grew up, um, first of all, as like a child of the eighties, I grew up obsessed with the Goonies, Raiders of the Lost Ark, yes. you know, Temple of Doom, all those things. I was like, you know, I was a Steven Spielberg kid. Right. So I grew up with this real love of adventure, exotic, you know, treasures and archaeology. And I don't know, I just loved all that stuff from the jump. I think part of that has to do with the fact that my dad was a um, deep sea diver. He was a commercial deep sea diver. So super okay. dangerous job working out in the North Sea and West Africa yeah. and Middle East. And so my dad was always coming back from these exotic places. So as a kid, you know, I was like, that's just thought that was, yeah, that's all I knew. I just thought it was the coolest thing. Like my dad had this super cool, adventurous life. Um, I went to school. Uh, for I went to Tufts University uh, here in Massachusetts, and I went to I double majored. My my poor parents, I don't know, they, uh, God bless them for supporting this. I double majored in archaeology and drama. And I don't know, like that's I, so perfect for the job. I know, though. but like, but at the time, it was like, what would you ever do with this? You know, how on earth is this going to add up to anything? But I loved archaeology and history. And so in college, I majored in that, but I also loved writing and performing. And, and so I double majored in drama and archaeology. And, and what's weird is how long it took me after college to kind of put those together. Like I, I thought, okay, I'm going to go to graduate school for archaeology and become, I wanted to become an underwater archaeologist. I, I thought that was going to be a, a really, that was the field for me because of my dad's work. I love diving. I love the ocean. And I thought that's what I was going to do. But I had been in Massachusetts pretty much my whole life. I grew up here, went to, went to college here. And I thought I'll go to LA for a few years and try the acting thing for a bit and the performing thing and see kind of what that does. And then I'll go to grad school and become an underwater archaeologist. I never quite made it out of LA, but for those first years in LA, it never occurred to me to try hosting or to try to work in this other field that I was in. I just saw them as two separate things. Yeah. And so when I finally had an opportunity to host a show that was about traveling and adventure and archaeology, I was like, oh yeah, right. Why didn't I, why didn't I put these things together earlier? So it took me a while to get there. And I, I do think it's a combination of, you know, like anything, any success, it's, it's a combination of hard work and and total dumb luck. And uh, and so, yeah, it's one of those things where I, I it took me a long time to get to the starting line of, oh, yeah, put all this together. Have you always loved traveling? Yeah, my mother is British. And so as a kid, we would go to England every year to visit my my family over there. So from an early age, I was kind of going over to the UK and I and between that and my dad, I kind of had this this sense of like, oh, wow, there's like a big world out there. You know, there's a lot going on out there. And so I, I always had an interest in it. Um, and when I got to LA after college, I would start traveling more. I'd start, I was waiting tables, you know, I was an actor, right? So I was waiting tables and I'd make a little money and I'd go take a trip and I'd make a little money and I'd go take a trip. Meanwhile, never sort of putting together that I should professionally attempt to do these two things. It, also, it was like before the YouTube era. So it's like, if it, if it was now... 
I think I'd be like, oh, I should be a content creator, right? Like, right. It, like it's, if I was born slightly later, I think it would have all snapped earlier because now you're everyone can become a content creator, right? So, but but that wasn't as apparent to me then. Yeah. What's your sounds geeky? What's your sign? Are you a Sag oh, or a Leo? I'm a, or I'm a Leo. You're a Leo. Yeah. Well, your second okay, guess. How did sense. you? Yeah. Well, I'm I, a Leo <laughs> and an only child, so that I could be a real jerk if I need to be. <laughs> da, 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 da. That's right. It's all about me, Danica. The it's drama all about comes me. In. That's it's the Josh where the show. drama comes in because like Leo's are like the quintessential kind of actor sign totally. because totally. you're always it's like an on stage kind of like influence. And totally. uh, but Sag just love to travel. So I was kind of curious if you had you might have it more in your chart. I took a couple levels of astrology and I've heard from guys that there isn't a girl in the world that doesn't think about astrology. So <laughs> I thought I'd I just... know it's it's it, but it's a funny thing. Like, I think the other big influence for me, though, is like being an only child. The only children tend to have to like kind of make their own fun in a way like they get more attention and they get more opportunity from their parents usually, but they kind of have to make up their own world a little bit. So um, I think part of it's that, too. As a, as a kid, I was just kind of like, you know, you have to kind of be very imaginative as an only child. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of imaginative, what's the, so is there always a theme to each season of, um, expedition Expedition unknown or is it, or is it just kind of, or is that only sometimes? So so it's by episode, right? So each episode is is typically about a mystery of some kind, somewhere in the world that we're going to tackle. And we're looking for shows that where there's active work going on, you know, like, it would it would be unusual for us to do an hour on, I don't know, dragons. <laughs> you know, it's like unless somebody's digging up dragon bones, um, we probably won't won't tackle that. So um, we want to go somewhere where something's happening. So we we're looking for shows about some stories that are big, you know, marquee stories you've heard of, the Ark of the Covenant and the Oh my know, God, the, speaking of what why do you, you have it? Is it there at your house, the Ark of the Covenant? No, it's in, um, where do they think it is right now? Ethiopia. I'm, Ethiopia. It's they think it's in Ethiopia. Ethiopia. It's under Jerusalem. It's in someone's garage in Poughkeepsie. Have you watched all that stuff from like, like Graham Hancock stuff? and Yeah. I, you know, I, I, it's, it's a shadowy trail, the Ark of the Covenant. It sort of vanishes off the map a long, long time ago. And uh, who knows where it is? What do, you, what do you think it is? I mean, at ba- base level, I think there was a box that was venerated, that was kept in the Temple of Solomon, that was believed by the Hebrews to be the box that contained the broken tablets of the Ten Commandments, and what else is in there? The broken staff of Aaron is in there, and some manna, and I, I, you know, like, whether or not that's what was in there, you know, there are lots of objects that are venerated that they're like, that's, that's what that thing is. So yes, for sure, there was a a chest that was in that temple, um, and that temple was destroyed, and Jerusalem was sacked and was then resacked. And you know, I mean, over the history of Jerusalem is like, you know, um, the Babylonians are here, and the and the the Arabs are here, and the Christians are here, and then the Arabs are here again. And you know, I mean, it's like it goes back and forth and back and forth. And so, um, you know, where does it go in all of that? I don't know. It's a pretty shadowy trail. Um, there are these whisperings oh maybe it went here maybe it went back to to babylon maybe it maybe it was hidden underneath the city of jerusalem there's a whole tradition that says oh it went to ethiopia um you know i'm sure that it was considering it was it was believed to be this incredibly holy thing unless it just ended up under a pile of rubble you know like in a in, in a um, when, a, when a building collapsed or something it probably was squirreled away off somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, the, the challenge with the Ark is like, there just isn't enough of a paper trail. It's like, mm-hmm. you just don't. I mean, it could be anywhere. And be a tablet trail. Was, yeah. And if it was, I mean, we we have descriptions from the Bible of what, it, of what sure. it looked like, but, you know, if it was wooden, if it was made of some organic material, and I mean, who right. knows? You, you know, I mean, isn't it might there, be. I mean, lost. I've been very curious about it. Isn't there a lot of, um, theories on the fact that the arc kind of fits perfectly into let's say the the 
what would be maybe a sarcophagus they'd call it in the king's chamber in the great pyramid it actually like the dimensions fit correctly inside of that and that like isn't there some some sort of mystery around like a blue mist energy where the ark has been um i mean there and then like, why does everyone why did people get sick around it too because there's stories and old stories about people not wanting to be around the ark because it would it was killing people well power of god type stuff i mean this is the kind of like you know this is this is the the thing about the ark and it's the thing about you know there there are a number of things like the ark that people just kind of um graft onto and 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 the 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 great pyramid is is like this as well these objects or these constructions that are so mystical to people that 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 kind of your head spins and people concoct a lot of theories about what they are and how they were built and what they were used for. You know, it's it's like it's tough. I mean, the ark is at its core, it's a symbol of God. It's a symbol of God. You know, his his commandments, his power, um, his presence, and and bringing that presence into the holy land. So it's like it is this incredibly important symbol for. Uh, both the Jewish and, and Christian faiths. And at the same time, it, it may be, you know, it, it probably was a real object. And so right. I think when you have this intersection between a physical thing and something that is mystical, then suddenly we concoct a lot of ideas about it. I mean, I personally see the Ark as something that probably did exist and probably is gone forever. You know, I mean, I think it is, a, it is there's just no could somebody open some chamber underneath Jerusalem one day under the walls of Jerusalem? And find, I mean, it's not impossible. Um, it certainly is a very particular looking object, the way that, that it's described with these angel wings and these, you know, um, on top. But I, but I, if I was a betting man, I would say the Ark is vanished into the pages. Well, what the hell are you going on an expedition for? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, that's a great question. But you know, this is this is kind of what the show's about. It's like it, it, it's kind of about this exact conversation, which is like we all know the Ark. Most of us know it from you know um, Temple or Sunday School or Indiana Jones. What's the deal with the Ark, right? I mean, that's that's that is kind of also at the core of of our show is this exploration of what's the real deal with object x or with mystery y right so we'll go looking for for things where there's a story that you know or you think you know and then we get into well what's what's real or what can we really say you know we're doing a show right now on moses to speaking of the ark um Mm -hmm. we're doing a show on um mysteries of moses and the ark is part of that but but only sort of tangentially really but there's this other big thing which is like was moses a real person like, is there right. a historical Moses? Like, was there a guy who genuinely was raised with the Pharaoh in Egypt, right. figured out he was Hebrew uh, or, or, or that he was a Semite, figured out that that, that he was not an Egyptian, saw the, the, these Egyptian slaves being mistreated and said, let my people go. We're getting out of here. We're going to the Holy Land. Like, did any of that really historically happen? Right. Yeah. So that's a huge, difficult question. And so it's really fun to go and meet with really smart people who are archaeologists and Egyptologists and historians who can shed light on on those questions, because, you know, we think about these these characters uh, and and we don't often think like, OK, if there was a Moses, like where's he buried? And there are there are multiple places that claim to be the tomb of Moses in the world. And I mean, shit, we don't even know where Jesus is really buried. Well, there we go. So another because question, he could like be another, in, another the, big, huge, you know, difficult question is like, I mean, there's the a theory he might be in Jesus. India, right? Like there's That's a right. theory. I, someone in just India, emailed like, me the other day. Age. Yeah, the other day, somebody emailed me this whole thing about the life of Jesus in India, you know, so exactly. The, the, these are the fascinating things that we dig into are these questions of like Man. looking at these stories and figuring out not just fact from fiction, but, but like, what does the archeological record show? What does history show? Um, and it's tough because look, I mean, whenever you deal with, especially things like the Ark or Moses or Jesus, you're, you're, you're treading into an area of faith too. So, so yeah, it, it is also exactly. this question of like, you have to be really cautious and diplomatic about how you approach those things. Yeah. Well, what about the they're really important bush? to a lot of people? What about the burning bush? Do you think that he was just high? 
Um, you know, there's theories on that too. <laughs> this is a weird thing. Like in, in the story of Moses, there's a lot of really wild supernatural stuff happening. Like there are these bushes that are burning, that are talking. There are staffs that are turning. I don't know if you've ever been high before. Plagues. Sometimes a bush might talk to you. Right. There, there are these plagues. These, I mean, th- this whole situation in, in the story of Moses, where Moses says to the Pharaoh, look, let my people go, or God is really going to, you know, whoop you. And Pharaoh's like, yeah, no, I don't think so. And God unleashes these horrendous plagues on Egypt that are, you know, like rivers turning to blood and boils and lice. This and frogs. is. Yeah, I mean, all sorts of horrible stuff. And then the last of these plagues, the the, the 10th plague, is like the nastiest of all, which is that God is going to kill every firstborn Egyptian right. son. He's right. going to kill all these babies, right? So like, this is like really, like the story of Moses is, is, is kind, I mean, I, I again, I'm, I don't mean to be disrespectful to it religiously, but just narratively, it's like an action movie. Like it is like a Hollywood blockbuster, which is why it was a Hollywood blockbuster, because it is like this incredible story of supernatural good versus evil. And, you know, you've got these villains and the Pharaoh and, and this reluctant hero and Moses, like the whole thing is just like a movie. It's this great story. So I'm really excited to dig into it on the show because it is one of those things where like, we all know this character. Everyone knows Moses. Everyone knows that name. Who is he? Who was he? Was he, you know, did he exist? So that's, that's the show in a nutshell. So fascinating. I love all that stuff because I'm so fascinated with, um, with, I don't, here's the weird thing. I remember being in fifth grade and asking my, what was called social studies. Then I remember asking my social studies teacher, Yes, Danica. What's the point of learning about history? Like, I just didn't right. care, get it. Like, to me, I, I like ancient history I've learned, but I don't like more like modern day. I don't like World War history, right, right. Um, that kind of stuff. But ancient history, ancient civilizations and, and, and ancient history with mystery around it, which the older it is, the more mystery there is, um, I find to be really fascinating because I feel like it's it's clues to how to like our reality and what we really, what pure potential could be because you've been to so many amazing places. Like how in the hell did they build the pyramid? Like the age old question. Right. And so once you finally, you know, if you could ever get that answer, then all of a sudden, you know, things open up in a new way because surely it's not with, whatever we thought they had back then. And if that's the case, then we can step into the next phase of growth and evolution and through awareness. And so why do you care? Like, why do you care about all of these um, ancient cities or um, all of these stories and all of the, all of the mystery? What is it that you, why do you give a shit? (laughs) It's such a great question. Um, I don't know for, for me, I think it's a couple different things. One of them is kind of a spooky thing, which is that Sometimes at these sites, like ancient Egypt's a great example. Rome is a great example. The Maya. I love the Maya. I'm big into them. Um, Sometimes you go to these ancient capitals, these ancient cities, and you look at how together these people were. Like they had government sorted out, engineering sorted out, mathematics. Um, they're, They're feeding huge amounts of people. They have civilization. They're making art. They are... Um, you know, forging ahead in science, like they've got the world figured out and it all falls apart and crumbles to nothing. And so part of it for me is like, when you stand in these places, I get kind of a chill of like, this could be us. This may be us. Like we may be the next thing that's, that's like this. And there is this weird echo of the past of like, how did they mess it all up? And what, what should we kind of remember about why they messed it all up? Because a lot of these civilizations really had their act together, you know, and, and, and it's, it's this fascinating thing. And I think, you know, COVID was kind of like this where it's like, there was this moment where we sort of realized, Oh, wait a minute. Like the world can just kind of reach out and smack you a tsunami, a plague, a, a, a massive natural disaster, uh, a, a meteor, you know, impacting the planet. This this idea that we're just living our lives and everything is permanent and, and civilization is here. No, like it can all go away 
tomorrow in the middle of this interview. Like it can all vanish. Right. So I don't know. That's part of it for me is the idea of like the, the sort of the achievement of these civilizations and then how they just completely disintegrate is fascinating. But I also kind of get fascinated on a personal level by them, like where you, you meet, I mean, meet is a weird word, but like you meet people, you meet skeletons and remains of people and you look at them face to face and you're like, this was a person. This was like, you know, history is so, sometimes it's so impersonal because we're talking about huge events and we don't kind of go down to that microscopic level of like this dude, this guy, this person. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you're at a dig site, you know, we were just in Egypt uh, at an excavation in Saqqara, which is this big, and we were there when they opened this little wooden coffin of this little girl who was probably like eight or nine years old. Mm. And, you know, her mummy was really badly preserved, but she had this beautiful necklace on and these beautiful earrings. And you could see that she'd been kind of laid in there with care and she'd been dressed up and she would have looked beautiful. I'm sure when she was, you know, mummified and, and you just sort of think this was a little kid who had such a short little life, but she was somebody's daughter. She was part of a family. And like all of that is just sort of gone. And there's something, even though it's a little bit, um, you know, um, it's a little scary to think about, but it's like you you sort of think about your place in this universe. And like, you know, we, we're, we're all going to end up, uh, you know, um, where where she is at some point. And so... It, there's there's something about connecting to the past, I think, that feels important to me because if you just sort of ignore it, um, yeah, I think you're missing out on a big a big part of of our collective kind of world, you know. So I I don't know, uh, but the the short dumb answer is um, I just think it's cool, you know. I mean, I just think going to these sites is cool, and I and I could roam around in these ruins and ask questions of someone much smarter than me all day because it's just cool. What has it taught you then? If you're looking at, I'm just thinking about, you know, you, you speaking about this, you know, little girl that was mummified and taken care of. And, and like, there was such, cause I mean, I've explored some of these places and there was such intention with like everything mm -hmm. and such detail and care and, um, yeah, significance to so many things, even the small things. Yeah. And, and, and I think to myself, like just in that example of someone getting buried and mummified and putting jewelry on them, like, how does it happen today? Some people get, you know, some people are cremated, some people, mm -hmm. you know, put in this box and they're given their favorite sweater and whatever, but like, it's not mummified. It's not, you know, all their nicest jewelry. It's not being buried in a gigantic uh, tomb that is adorned like everywhere every mm -hmm. every single inch of it with stories about who they were and now not everyone this is more of the pharaohs and the sure, really. high priests and priestesses yeah. and people like that um queens but but the look at how they were adorned and now i think like look at what are they going to think about someone that died now in 2022 and how that was taken care of? And I'm just kind of curious your thoughts when you put when putting that in perspective and then thinking to what it is that you have learned and your takeaway from visiting these places and experiencing them. I, I think when you look back through history, you see that there is a, a, a focus that people have on power, on authority on wealth. You see a lot of that, obviously. And you see these civilizations that expand beyond their reach that like they want more and more and more. And eventually it all falls apart because they're too big uh, or they can't keep the peace and other power players come in and, you know, it all goes to hell that way. Uh, but I think a big thing like the Maya are really interesting to me. And, and there's a site that I'm really obsessed with um, that I talk a lot about because I just kind of can never get it out of my head. It's a place called El Mirador. And it's, a, and it's a Maya site in northern Guatemala, right near the border of Mexico. So it's up near where Tikal is in, in northern Guatemala. And um, without boring anybody, the, the Maya, the, there's this thing called the pre-classic Maya and then the classic Maya. And basically what happens is like the Maya show up and everything's kind of great. And they build this big civilization and then the entire thing collapses. And it collapses 
like down to zero, like their language collapses, everything just goes completely away. It is a complete and total apocalypse. And then they reignite and they kind of start over. And that's the classic. So there's this big question, like what, what happened to this pre-classic Maya? Like, why did they flame out so badly down to ashes that they had to rebuild everything and restart everything? And at Almirador, which is this big pre-classic Maya capital, it's this huge mega city out in the jungle of Guatemala. You go there and first of all, it is about as Indiana Jonesy a site as you can get. It is just deep in the jungle. You can trek there, but it's miserable and it takes days through the swamps. There's no road out to it or you can helicopter in and you fly over jungle and jungle and jungle. And then there's a tiny little area cut out to land a helicopter. And then you're just engulfed in this jungle on the ground. And there's just pyramids and temples everywhere as far as you can see. So the city is roughly the size of Los Angeles. If that, I mean, which is insane, right? Like this place is, this is like the, megalopolis of wow. the ancient, you know, Mesoamerican world. Wow. So it's like the it, Karnak of uh, yeah, exactly. North America. It's this gigantic, gigantic place. And there are um, these huge constructions there. The main pyramid there called La Danta may be uh, the biggest pyramid in the world by volume. It's not the tallest. It's not as tall as the Great Pyramid of Giza, but it, it may be wider. It, it is wider at the base. So it may be by volume, the biggest pyramid in the world. It's barely excavated this whole site. I mean, um, it's just wow. this incredible place. Huh. And when you go there and you learn about them and you learn about kind of why this all fell apart for them, the, the, the theme that comes up a lot is this concept of the conspicuous consumption of resources, which basically means they just started using everything in this jungle around them in ways they didn't need to, but they just thought looked cooler or were a little more luxe or just, mm. you know, better. They, they, they started paving everything with this kind of white limestone plaster that looks a lot like plaster in your house. Like it's, it's legit plaster. It's made from crushed up limestone in order to, in order to make it, you have to burn a lot of wood like a lot of trees and green trees that burn hotter. Oh. So you have to burn down lots of forest to make this stuff. Oh, and they shit. started plastering everything with this, with this stuff. Cause it just looked cool. It looked nice, better than walking around on dirt. Right. And as they started doing this, they just started chopping down and chopping down this forest. And what ended up happening to them at El Mirador, it looks like is something that they just couldn't have predicted, which is that not so much that they deforested it, but that like the trees, the roots of these trees were kind of holding back this mud that ended up kind of seeping into their water, that ended up making it harder to grow crops, that ended up sort of poisoning their food supply. It's one of those like butterfly effect things wow. where they just sort of thought, hey, we're the masters of this domain. We can do whatever we want to this ecosystem. It'll support us. We're the best. And the environment kind of you know, we don't totally understand our environment, right? Because it's made mm. up of billions of life forms that are all interacting in this crazy ecosystem. And so um, they tipped the balance in a way that they fell apart. They ended mm. up not being able to eat. And like, you know, food, like, even though it sounds boring, the capacity to feed people is a big deal. And it's a big deal in the ancient world. And food supply is something that we totally take for granted in the modern world. We kind of shouldn't because, we just think the supermarket's always going to have stuff in it. But if things get really bad, that won't Which be the we've case, seen. right? So, yeah. When you can't so, get your quinoa. That's right. So, um, you know, like civilizations can fall apart if they just keep doing more and more and more. And I think getting back long-windedly to your question, what are people going to think when they see us? I think they're going to marvel at, weirdly, I know this is like a, a strange answer. I just think they're going to be so blown away by the amount of plastic. I just think they're going to look, because this plastic is going to be around forever. Like they're going to find plastic, yeah. you know, bottle caps and, and soda rings and stuff forever. And if we all go to ashes, they're just going to, much as the ancient world is all about pottery, that's their plastic. That's the plastic of the ancient world. Everything was carried around in these ceramic jugs. Yeah. We're gonna, people are just going to be like, oh, this is a classic. Uh, this is this type of bottle, this type of thing. And mm -hmm. I think they're going to kind of wonder why we, 
because we know it's bad, right? Like we know all that stuff is like not great. And we know it's, it, I mean, nobody, even people who aren't particularly environmentally motivated, yeah, they kind of know that plastics are like not great, right? But we just don't really seem to care that much. And and by the way, I'm not up on some pedestal here. I went and bought my kids these like eight packs of like, you know, apple juice things that are like, you drink them in two sips and then you throw them in the garbage the little mini individual things that yep. thing will be in a landfill for like hundreds of years. My kid drank it in seven seconds, you know? Yeah. And you just think like, why are like, why are we doing this? And the answer is because it's convenient. Right. And we like it. So I don't know. Part of what I think they're going to say about us is, man, we burned pretty bright. Like we, we just were real consumers. Like we loved making and buying things. So I think that's dangerous. Yeah, but I'm also no as guilty as anybody of it. So I'm really, I've really wondered many times if, um, if really, I'm going to start here and then we'll grow the idea. Um, if we just kind of come and go evolutionary as humans, like some variation of human kind of just comes and goes and it's just, we're like an ecosystem to the planet. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, you know, you just get too big, you get too greedy, whatever it is, and Earth swallows you up and says, let's start again. And yeah. we can continue on with that. But what do you think about that idea? And is I, there I any evidence think, that shows that? Yeah, I mean, I do think if you if you look at, you know, the evolution of species, it's like you you cut it or you don't, you compete. And if you don't make it, you don't make it. I mean, there's no question that like, we could as a species, like the most obvious game in and ender for us right is nuclear right war, right so we as a species could uh get to such a point where somebody finally pushes one of these buttons because there are these you know these these um weapons all over the world and we could go and have a uh, a nuclear war which would uh, not only kill a lot of people what would poison a lot of the planet and okay. i don't think humanity would be erased but it would be like a you know biblical setback um and we would probably have to kind of become you know scrape our way out of the ashes and start over i mean I, yeah i think that what about that, going yeah. inner earth what about going inner earth then to hide from it and what about yeah, the but, what about but, but, the, what about how? inner earth people? No, there's no inner earth people. <laughs> you been watching? You watching King Kong movies too much? Hell yeah, I am watching King Kong and all kinds of other crazy stuff on YouTube. I love. I that mean, stuff. we can build a bunch of shelters and live down there, and life would be pretty miserable. I mean, know, what's like, the difference between that and like inner earth? I mean, like if you have to go inside the earth to wait out the storm, why didn't couldn't somebody else have done that? Yeah, but there's no sunlight down there. There's no food. Like, how do you grow anything? How do you? What if I don't they have know. their own I mean, ark and the ark makes some light? Danica. I am proposing many crazy things because <laughs> I love to get a reaction and I, hear what takes, what gets traction. You know, if you think there's a bunch of Morlocks hanging around down there, walking around in their secret underground chambers, <laughs> uh, to me, first of all, let's just think about it this way. If you were one of these underground people, who the hell would want to live underground? Why wouldn't you just come up through a sewer grate and be like, enough of this. I want to be out here where it's sunny. I think the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles did that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I just think that, yes, to answer your first question, yeah, the earth can swallow us up like the bugs that we are. And, and, yeah. and I think that, and, and COVID, I think was a little bit of a wake up call that like, yeah. You can have, especially because of how globalized we are now and air travel, and we just are constantly in each other's, right? Every day, thousands of people are, are crossing borders. Millions of people are crossing borders. So um, yeah, a, a plague, um, a weapon, a bioweapon, a nuclear weapon. Yeah, like we are not, we are not any safer from extinction than okay. anybody else. Or the dinosaurs, a meteor could hit the planet. Okay, let's hop, skip, and a jump to another crazy idea because you've you've done some stuff around it. But um, extraterrestrials. I mean, okay, here's my take. I 100 percent believe in extraterrestrials. There is no doubt. Anyone who doesn't think that there isn't life somewhere else in the universe is at this point. It's a really hard argument to make. I mean, the data just shows that there are earth-like planets there are planets that sit in this sweet spot in other solar systems of course there are right and those conditions of sunlight and an atmosphere 
you know, we know things will grow. So, I mean, I, I just think that as each day marches on, you, it, it's just becoming clearer and clearer that the probability is just overwhelming that there's life in the universe. Whether it's been here and is like skulking around in the shadows, I am much more skeptical about. It. Now, there are things that I have seen, some of these videos, these Navy videos that show these high speed. I mean, I don't know what they are. I don't have all the answers. There's just something to me a little, I, I have a, a sort of a hard time believing that they're here or they've been here and they're just kind of hiding and taking cows and testing on them and stuff. I, I don't know. I just, it, it, it does seem like, I guess my theory is that life exists in the universe, but it is rare. Like it's, I mean, rare meaning yeah. you have to travel a long way to find it. So right. I would think but that if given the fact that there are like trillions of galaxies or billions yeah, of so, galaxies. So like maybe not rare mathematically, but probably rare that any one species could ever reach another, right? Yeah. That Because yeah. in order to do that, you not only have to not blow yourselves up and become so advanced that you can create some sort of technology that is way ahead of where we are to create faster than light travel. So you, you have to, you, you have to you stick get off around the planet. You mean the stuff that we're talking about right now, getting yes. off the planet, you mean yes. the stuff that we're doing right now, yeah, oh, but, okay. but like, but, but to reach another planet of people, we are so far from that baby steps, man. We're like, steps, a, right? you know. but, but, but that's what I'm saying. Like you got to hang around long enough that you don't get wiped out by another civilization, a meteor, a plague, a whatever. You, you have to survive long enough to become that advanced. And then I feel like if you pull that off and you're going to go all the way across the universe, you're going to go and like not hide. You're going to be like, what's up? We're here. We did it. I don't buy this whole, they're, 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 they're all sneaky. Why are they sneaky? Why because, are aliens sneaky? Because they're different and we'd freak out. Like, what would you know. do if you saw, if you saw, even if you saw like Bigfoot or, or like something crazy that we don't know if really exists, but maybe, and, and this is like within our psyche even. And if you saw it and it kind of resembles this and that, and you put them together and you're like, oh, you'd still freak the hell out. You'd still right. be like, this holy is the, this shit, is the you'd Star run Trek. or you'd shoot it and you'd test it. Yes. Right. This is the sort of childhood's end or like this is like a Star Trek thing. This is the, this is the prime directive in Star Trek. You don't mess with a civilization with a with a with a planet that's more primitive than you because it will totally alter their development because they'll start worshiping you or try to kill you or whatever. I guess that's sound thinking. I mean, I'm a big Star Trek fan, so I I get it, but I just kind of think I don't know. I just haven't seen anything compelling enough to have me say yes that's what i think is happening stop it you've been to like all of these crazy places in the world that you can't explain how things were built and how they had the technology and why is it so perfect and why is it astrologically aligned in such perfection why does this why does stonehenge line up perfectly with the solstice like why do all these things exist like did they really have the technology then i'm in the camp that they did no then how did they do it they did i'm i'm giving i'm giving these ancient people more credit i i think that that it is remarkable what you can do if you are laser focused on it like, you know, people talk about, I mean, Stonehenge. Okay. Yeah. Stonehenge is astronomically fascinating, but like, look at it. It's pretty like homespun. It's a bunch of blocks that are kind of yeah, like, but they're megalithic stones. That I know, but like, but it's not like some like laser cut away. alien. They came from like hundreds of miles away. I know, but I think they rolled you, them on wood on logs. Really? Let me tell you something. Never. Un <laughs> this is this is my one big counter argument to uh, people who believe in like alien intervention stuff. Never underestimate the ability to do difficult things if you don't have much else to do. <laughs> I'm serious. Like if you're in Egypt, you're like, OK, I'm the pharaoh. Um, it's a million degrees. I got the Nile. We're making food. Things are happening. I'm a I'm a, you know, egomaniac. Uh, I want a giant thing built. 
Uh, and I'm the Pharaoh. So everybody's going to, you know, either I'm going to pay this workforce or I'm going to enslave people. That's a big debate. But I think that most of it are like workers. And it's like nobody has anything else to do. Build me this thing. I mean, look what Taylor Swift did with the pandemic, man. She made some albums. She See? got busy. She got busy. This is what I'm saying. That's her Stonehenge. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you have nothing else to do, you can do a lot. And if you have enough people, all of these places where there's pyramids and giant constructions, they never, it's not like they're happening in places where nobody's around. They're with these huge population centers where it's like, these people need something to do. We're going to put them on this pyramid project. So you've no. been to Egypt, you know, the Nile, you've been on the Nile, I've been on the Nile, you've been down to Aswan, you've been, you've been to probably the quarry where they supposedly got I've all of the their quarry. stones, like I have two and you're like, Oh, here and then you think, Oh, okay, it's going on boats. Have you seen those boats? They don't look real sharp. They don't look real sharp. And then you but, think to yourself, and how did they even get the big stones onto the boat? Like, it just does not make sense. It it you Danica, you've got to give them more credit. And I can't. I won't. I I know what people. I, I think won't do it. Human nature look, is to do the but, minimum. But, Back but, then, but, they could have just when like you go, sailed off into the desert. When you go to these quarries, um, the big one is down at Silsila, which is this cool Egyptian quarry. There are like obelisk shaped notches missing from the walls. Like they're clearly popping huge blocks out of these walls, right? And we know that. Not all of them made it. Like there's big chunks of blocks in the bottom of the Nile. Like our boat didn't work right. Like you can see that they're trying stuff and they're moving things. And by the way, when you went to Egypt, you probably saw the bent pyramid. They messed up a pyramid. They yeah. got halfway up and they were like, ah, shit. And then they had to change the angle on it. So like you can see that they're working on it. But I'm telling you, I'm sticking with my theory, which is if you don't have much to do, you can do a lot. What have you done the last three weeks? Nothing. <laughs> See? Well, have kept my children alive. That's difficult. That's actually always hard. I <laughs> We're mean, near the ocean here. It's the constant threat of drowning. <laughs> my, my sister's little girl has a shiner, and I'm like, you know, it just, you know, it happens. You know, she's two every, and she's oh, every a black day. eye, and you're like, meh, it is what my it is. My kids, like, if social services got to look at my kids, like, they're covered in bruises and cuts and scrapes and splinters. <laughs> sweatshirts like, and sweatpants for, for the kids every day. Every day. I got to hide it. Yeah, no, they're just, they're living their, their, their little lives. They're testing things out. And when you test things out, much like the Bent Pyramid, you yeah. fall down sometimes. Mm. Have you ever had any like super scary moments in any of these places that you've gone where you've thought, hmm, you know, this is all fun and games until you're about to, you know, like fit like physically or like actually kind of anything. I mean, maybe there's been something physical or something in, that has endangered, but also yeah. if there's anything like spooky, scary, like, you know, you opened up the door to a tomb and all of a sudden, right. you know, you saw a ghost fly out and you're like, Holy shit. So like physically a bunch of stuff. I mean, I knock on wood all the time that like my crew and I have done as well as we have, but like, yeah, all sorts of, of things. I mean, I have spent the last 15 years flying in the sketchiest planes and helicopters and cars. And I mean, you know, so um, I was in an airplane once in Romania that the roof ripped off of during flight. What? Yeah. It was an old Russian plane and we were flying in Romania and I was in the cockpit and we were filming and the roof peeled off like a can of <laughs> and, and like, I would say, scary, but I know I always say to people, like if you're in a plane and then suddenly you're outdoors, like that's <laughs> not good. That's right. very bad. I hope you weren't high, very high up because pressurization, I think is important. We were not. Thank God. Um, and, the, and it was a non-pressurized <laughs> plane. So um, you thought you were good. asking for a convertible. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, we've had that happen. We've had a lot of run-ins with wildlife at El Mirador at that Maya site. Yeah. I was sitting doing an interview with an archaeologist on this temple step. And my camera guy just started screaming, snake, snake, snake. And we turned and there was a fertilance, which is this very dangerous snake um, in uh, in Central America that uh, that was just cruising down this stair aggressively coming at us. And, you know, jumped up and jumped out of the way. And we've had a lot of run-ins like that of like 
snakes and scorpions and, you know, spiders and things like that, that are, you know, you, you just, you'll walk down a trail five times with a crew. And then the sixth time you look and there's like a pit yeah. viper in a tree and you go, man, we walked past that five times. Yeah. And- you and Bear Grylls should do a show going to all the, uh, doing, getting to scary places. He could help. Bear Grylls is, is legit, man. He, you know, I'm a, I'm a world travel and adventure guy. He is a legit survivalist. I think Bear Grylls would, would eat me for lunch in terms of, uh, you know, being out in the woods for the night. But well, we um, did eat a scorpion together. So yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah. And he told story, yeah, yeah. he's told this other story about he, uh, to stay hydrated on uh, one time he had, he got a snake and he kept the snake skin and he peed in the snake skin. And then he like, kept it and then drank it later. I mean, that's the I big just, difference between bear and I, he's much more interested in drinking urine than I am. I think is the big way more interested in drinking urine. He, it comes up a lot weirdly. It's uh, yeah, that's not, uh, it's not, I'm not as interested in that. Anything freaky, anything shock you or take you like totally off guard that, you know, cause you, look, you were talking about El Mirador and how, you know, it's, it's less known than let's say Egypt, but it's not no less shocking and amazing yeah. and, and I mean, awe inspiring. And so maybe, and, and you talk about like who writes the history books, it's like the, the victors do and who wrote these stories. So there might be places out there that are like, Holy crap. How do we not know about this? I've, I've had a few. So like the very first series that I hosted was a show called destination truth. And it was on sci-fi and it was kind of what I call an ooga booga show. So we would go around the world and we would investigate legends and mysteries and paranormal stuff. And I always was very honest on the show that I was a kind of a paranormal agnostic, that it was sort of like, I, I'm happy to go look for ghosts in this place that you say is incredibly haunted and I'm into it. And I kind of like, I want to see a ghost. I mean, I don't want it to hurt me, but like I, who wouldn't want some validation of the other side. Right. So, um, but I don't really know that I'm going to, that, that was always my approach. And so I went to a lot of really scary places on that show and spent the night in a lot of scary places. And, you know, it's this weird thing of like, there are places that have a vibe. I'm not a very, like, I'm not an overly kind of spiritual person, but I, I there are places- Right. But there are places that I will say, and I would say this to any hardened skeptic, that there are places that you walk into that have a vibe. They have an energy. I have no idea what that is, um, but I don't think it's just my mind kind of saying, oh, this is a spooky place. There are just places you, there are people's houses you walk into that are perfectly nice houses. And you walk in and you go, I don't want to be here. And, And there are places that you walk into where you feel an incredible sense of relaxation or joy. And it may, and it's not necessarily some incredibly beautiful place. Like there are just places that kind of seem to emote something. And so, yeah, there are places that I went to. I mean, there's, we used to go to these abandoned insane asylums and hospitals and stuff. There's a place called Waverly Hills. Do you know that place? I feel like I've heard of that. Terrifying. Is they, that they've they, probably done a they've probably done a um, they've what's done a bunch of ghost effect? shows there. It's uh, terrifying. Yeah, and yeah. Hosted a um the 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 show Ghost Hunters did a live show there, which I hosted. I wasn't really participating in it. I was just kind of the host, and I had to move around throughout the night to different kind of host locations to, to the night through the night. Oh, you were the there night. at night, mm-hmm. and I just hated it. I hated walking around there alone. I had my binder and my notes, and I'd have to go from one side of the property to the other. And I kept thinking to myself, "What are you afraid of?" Like you're 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 a grown man. You're just walking. There's lots of people kind of around. I was so spooked out by that place. It just had the worst energy. Mm. And there are, there are a couple of times in my life where I've had an experience that I truly can't explain. One was we did an episode of destination truth in China at this section of the great wall of China, which was known as the wild wall. And it's this area where there's all these ghost stories about the wall. And Mm. it's purportedly this very haunted area. Mm. And we were there And we used to wear these kind of goofy backpacks on that show, which had camera equipment attached to them and a kind of a swing arm that would come around to film your face. 
So these little kind of Ghostbuster packs that that back in the day had actual like mini DV decks on them and stuff. It was like all on you, like a. It was mount? all on your back, and the okay. camera could film you, so you kind of oh, did yeah. independent roving Got kind it. of system, right. And every hour or so, though, they had to the camera guys would have to get behind you and change out the batteries and the mini DV sure. tapes, right. Okay. So you kind of stand there and they jostle you around a little bit and, and they you know, try to get the door open on the thing. And, and I remember standing on this section of the wall and it was an hour was up and we were going to change my tapes and my camera guy was behind me and he was changing all the stuff in the backpack and really moving me around kind of roughly, like he couldn't get something open. And I hmm. turned over my shoulder to ask him something and there was nobody there and he was 50 feet away. And it was the only time in my life that I ever felt physically moved by something. Yeah, and yeah. then, of course, I spent the next, you know, week in my head going, was it one of those things where I thought somebody was behind me? So psychologically, I felt like I was being moved. And I was like, no, I was being like manhandled. Yeah, it wasn't like still, subtle either because you, you were telling the it story not that subtle it's, at it's all. aggressive. So it's not yes. even just like you kind yes. of felt something and maybe you could manufacture that in your head. This right. was like, what the heck is that? Right. So I don't know. And then another time we were at a place in Japan called the Suicide Forest, which is a place. That sounds really, yeah, it's already spot for exactly bring the kids. Um, (laughs) It's this forest in Japan where people will go to commit suicide. It's become like a popular suicide destination. And where is this again? It's in Japan. It's called. I think think I've heard. I think I've watched some stories about that. It's one of those that you don't want to go in. Yeah. I mean, it's a very, very weird place. And, um, and so we were there overnight. And of course, Akigahara is the name mm. of it. And it's also known as the Sea of Trees in the northwestern flank of Mount Fuji. So mm. I, I kept in my head, I kept thinking, I do not want to run into an actual person who's hanged themselves here. And that can happen there. Like it, it happens. Oh. Oh, so shit. I kept thinking like, that was my big fear. It's like, I yeah. really don't want to suddenly be in like a real horror film here, you know? Yeah. And I thought I saw more than out of the corner of my eye. Like I thought I saw in the woods with me, somebody standing very close to me off to my right, a woman. And it like, I could see her, like somebody was there and then she just wasn't. And I at the time was like, that's your brain. That's like, you were so worked up about the possibility of seeing something that you matrixed in something and you had a weird waking hallucination or did I, I I don't know, but I know that I thought I saw someone in those woods for a second and then they were gone. So that kind of stuff stays with you. And so the, and then to me, the other, the final kind of like weird spiritual thing that's happened to me. I mean, I've been in lots of spooky places where I thought I heard things and, We saw things on thermal imagers that I can't explain. I mean, that happened a lot to me, Mm. Uh, but none of them kind of sent me like over the edge into like, you know, full scale, like paranormal. The the other thing is, I think we might've mentioned this when you, when you came on my show is, is ayahuasca. Yeah. Um, uh, I did ayahuasca on, on our, on my expedition unknown. We did it. We did a a series about the afterlife a few years ago and we filmed an ayahuasca ceremony with me in, in Peru. How'd that go? it was, uh, have you done it? Did, we, did I ask you this? Have you I have. It? You yeah. have done it. Um, in Peru. It was, <laughs> in, in Peru. It was, um, it was incredible. It was the longest night of my life. Uh, <laughs> well, it is a long journey. It was a long journey. And um, parts of it were absolutely beautiful. Parts of it were really scary. It was kind of all the above. Yeah. And, um, but it was the kind of thing where when it was over, the next day, and even now, like it really has stayed with me. I think about totally. it quite a lot. You can't forget. You know? Yeah. You just can't and, forget, right? Yeah. And, and, and I kind of was left with kind of two thoughts, which is that either I had an experience that was totally external to me, like it was spiritual. I went somewhere else. I actually had this experience. It was real, right? Either that, which if that's true, that's mind blowing, right? For me personally, that's like, well, holy shit, I saw <laughs> the mysteries of the universe, right? Oh, you name it. I mean, like t- beings and alien ships. And so you're wondering, and, did I go off planet? Did, did, did I go? Did, did I go okay. and like either come like to some other dimension and okay. commune mm-hmm. with whatever? Um, or it's all in your head. It's a chemical reaction. It happened in your brain. It's all in your head. And if that's true, that's also crazy because it just reveals 
that our minds, the power of our brain is so mysterious to us, yeah. right? That like, we don't actually, this entire thing, this entire reality in front of us, like put aside the spiritual thing. Let's, let's pretend there's none of that. Let's just pretend it's all chemical, right? It just means that what you think is happening around you, your perception of the world, it's just this thing that your brain is making and telling you that here's what's in front of it. It's just signals coming into your eyes and your brain is like, here's what's there. And your brain can alter that and change that. And then you kind of go, well, wait a minute, what's real and what is reality and what the heck am I? And then your brain kind of breaks and you go. Welcome to my number one question I think about every day. Yeah. So to me, that was like my big takeaway from ayahuasca is that either I had a genuine spiritual experience or my brain is so untrustworthy and full of mystery. And either way, it's like, <laughs> it's amazing, right? Either way, it's truly amazing. Well, did it, did it, I mean, it sounds like it had long-term effect because you say you can't forget. So what is, uh, what was the, the learning or how, did it change your life? It did. You know, I mean, I, it, it's, People ask me, I, I should preface the answer by saying, people ask me if I recommend doing it. And I say that in some ways I'm more scared of it now that I've done it because I, my, my experience with drugs prior to ayahuasca was fairly limited. I mean, I'd been stoned and I'd taken mushrooms in, in, in college, you know, but, but I, I hadn't really done heavy duty hallucinogens like that. That was not in my resume. And so I wasn't totally prepared for how transportative it was. I sort of thought, because people say, oh, sometimes you see snakes and spiders and creepy crawlies. Like that that happens on ayahuasca. And mother stuff. ayahuasca is a snake. Yeah, so yeah. Mother ayahuasca is going to show like you nature imagery, right? And so I thought, okay, Josh, what's the worst that can happen? You're in this hut and a snake is going to come in here that you're going to hallucinate a snake coming into this hut. And you can get through that, you know, that that's as bad as it, as it's going to be, because it can't hurt you. It's not there. What I wasn't prepared for is that I wasn't in the hut. Like I left uh, the building. Right. So uh, like I, now that I know that sections of it can be that powerful that you can sort of actually go somewhere. Um, now I'm more skin. Now I'm like, Oh my God, anything could have happened. It could have been a, because some people take it and they have truly horrendous experiences and some people take it and they have cosmic experiences that change their lives for the better. Did you just do it and once? I did it once. Uh, I know some people go for like a week. I just can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, every time is different, you know? Yeah. I know every time is different and everyone tells you there's going to be good nights and bad nights and all that stuff. So when I say to when people say to me, should I do it? I go, I don't know. Like I saw things that were very scary. I saw things that were really beautiful, yeah. but I also, now that I know what it can be. Yeah. I think you could have a total Jacob's ladder nightmare experience where you spend six to eight, nine hours yeah. in an absolute so, psychological torture chamber. So do you think it gave you, cause the saying would be, it gives you, doesn't give you what you want. It gives you what you need. Do you feel like it gave you what you need? And then I'm going to continue on and say, you've got all this skepticism of like, uh, extraterrestrial and ghosts and all, you know, there's like a skepticism beyond what you can see. And all you did was see a bunch of that stuff. So mm. I know. So mm. I, I do sort of think it gave me, I mean, look, we, I, we were making a show about the afterlife. So when they said for people who don't know, when you, when you do these ayahuasca ceremonies, you are asked usually to have an intention or a question or something that you want to ask mother ayahuasca, this, you know, this, this, um, sort of spirit plant of, medicine, uh, energy plant medicine. Right. So, and they will also tell you, as you just said, it doesn't always give you the answer that you want. It might give you what you need, um, which might not be the thing you think you want. Um, <laughs> and so I kind of went in there with two different things. One was for the show. And one was for me personally, the one for the show was what happens when we die? We're, we're here to talk about the afterlife. So I want to mm -hmm. understand the afterlife. That's yeah. why I'm here. That's the show that we're making. This is called the vine of death. It is supposed to connect us to this other world, this natural realm. What's there. And then I had a personal intention, which was much more about me and my kids and my career and my life, which is that I have these two young children I travel for an enormous part of the year. I want to be a good father. I want to be a successful, you know, person at my at my career. 
how do I do all this and balance the world? And that, that was kind of my personal intention going in. So I got none of that. Really? None of it. Well, how, like many that, years, that that? how many years ago was this? Um, maybe two or three years ago, three Did years ago. Did life change at all in the last two or three years? Yeah, but but yeah. but what one of the things that they also said to me was, you know, one of the ways in which the 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 experience can be quite unpleasant is if you try to force things, like totally. never yeah. fight it. Just sort yeah, of, yeah, you probably won't have much of an experience if you do that. Actually, right. So I kind of had hoped that I would see my children, that that would be part of it. It just wasn't. It was all about the afterlife and about death. I mean, it was just that was what it gave me, Good. and so because of that. Um, W- which is fine. You know, I kind of went in with it with a two first, so it didn't necessarily, you know, uh, you, you don't always get what you want. Right. But I did have this very profound experience surrounding the idea of death and life. And, and it didn't sort of give me a, Oh, here's all the answers kind of, Oh, it's all tied up in a bow sort of thing. But I did have feel as though it took me on this real journey into the natural world, into the universe. I was Mm -hmm. in the stars. I was, you know, very outside of my body, I felt. And I don't know, I felt very at peace with this sort of natural churn of the universe, Mm. I guess, is the only way I can put it, a sort of blender of, you know, we, we are all from this stuff. We are going back to this stuff. We are all kind of recycled around in this big cosmic blender. And there was something about that that felt really big and very, even though it seems kind of scary to hear that, to, to feel that it felt very reassuring in a way. Um, have you seen the series, how to change your mind by Michael Pollan that just came out? I haven't. I've heard it's great. Yeah. Well, it goes into a lot of that. And like psilocybin is one of those um, really key medicines that a lot of people take when they're, if, cancer and it's terminal and they have like complete peace with, with death after that, because they see that it's not that the nature of reality is not uh, limited to what we see um, with our eyes in this reality that we're in. It's, there's so much more and um, that it's, there's more of a continuation and that the, the universe Mm -hmm. is really like quite is like all love and connected and that, they have a real peace with it. So interesting. I think it's interesting to talk about these things because they're was it a positive emerging. experience for you? Yeah. I mean, my life changed a lot after, but you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my great, my great lesson was um, having like a, an, an idea that a relationship is supposed to be this super like perfect balance. Someone comes mm-hmm. in and, and my lesson was that it wasn't going to come from someone else. It was going to be with myself. Mm-hmm. And then I had to die to this idea that it was going to, I was going to find some perfect mate. It was really me. Oh, that was, that sucked. Yeah. But it's a big lesson, right? It's a big lesson. I'm still, I mean, it's still an integrate. Like you say, it sticks with you. So, you know, it's funny when I went down there, uh, and I spoke and because I was, again, doing it for a show as well. So we did a lot of interviews with the people that were working down there in this in this um, camp, you know, down in the Amazon. And one of the things that they said is that one of the worst, if, if, if they kind of statistically look at the people who come there, they said that most couples who come as a couple don't fare well. That yeah. like most couples that go there and they're like, we want to understand our relationships and that they end with one of them saying, I'm out of here. You know, like it, yeah. that, that, that people looking for those answers in someone else often come away with this experience that it's something that they have to deal with themselves, that they yeah. have to, you know, yeah. so that's, that's a common, that's a common part of that story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just think, you know, you got all these places and there's so many other modalities to um, growth and evolution and knowing more. I mean, these, mm-hmm. I mean, medicine ceremonies are common all over the world in different ways and through different, different means, but, um, but they're, but they're, but they're very common. And, um, totally. that's the great thing about travel is getting exposure to some of that stuff and, you know, uh, learning more about how to grow and expand. I think fundamentally, um, just like the universe is growing and expanding. I think our purpose is to grow and expand. What do you think? What do you think our purpose is to being here? Well, like that, that kind of brings us full circle to what we started in the beginning. Like when I, when I look back at the history of all of these civilizations and you see, at least at the kind of big level, you, you see conflict, power struggles, 
you know, overreaching of, of these civilizations. And, and of course, there's all these individual stories that are lost underneath all that of, of just regular folks. But I do think that I think our function here, if the, I mean, I don't know if there is a function, but I think the best use of our time is to be present and to love and to care for people and to do all those things that are kind of hard to do because we do all get swept up in our careers and our responsibilities and our jobs and and the fact that life is hard. It is. Every day there are things that are frustrating for all of us and, and difficult. And so I don't know. To me, that's the big lesson. I, I look at all these tombs and all these people. It doesn't matter whether you were um, an eight-year-old girl or whether you were the pharaoh. Um, we're all going the same way. And so one of the things, the lessons that I look, I'm I'm someone who I'm I work too much, I'm hard on myself, I've driven, I have a lot of things I want to do, I'm always on the move, I have a lot of responsibilities. You might know what some of those things are like. Um, you have yeah, a lot I was of like, irons I'm in the fire. Is there me? Yeah. And 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 so, and those things do bring me joy. Like I I don't like yeah. not doing anything. Like I don't think there's anything wrong with that stuff. Right. But it is also the case that you can just get sort of swept up in the stress of all of that, and just get swept up in the the, the grind of it all. And so for me, I think the the big lesson for me is to, to look at all those people and to realize you know, what a gift that we're alive at this moment and what a gift that we're here at all, you know, cosmically that we're just here. So I try to remember every day to sort of take a deep breath and think about all those civilizations and places that have come and gone and how important all those things were. And now they're just gone. Mm. And to think, okay, that what's really important is just that we're here and we're here and now. And so have a good day. You know, I mean, I know that sounds so trite in a way, but I really do think it is kind of like, be good, be happy when you can. Um, and generally don't be an asshole. You know, I mean, that's kind of, I think what we're aiming for here. Yeah. Well, sweet you know? Jordan Peterson says we don't get away with anything in life. So yeah, um, with that in mind, you gotta, you know, you do your, do your best. Um, that's right. all right. Well then to wrap it up, um, and let you go and let you get on with the rest of your vacation. Thank you for talking to me during um, vacation. Oh, are you kidding? It's great. My, I, I'm uh, my, my 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 kids are probably thrilled. I'm not chasing after them. Uh, <laughs> they're like, eating stop, ice cream. Stop, right stop. Now they're eating ice, yeah, balls. totally. They're with their grandparents. They're eating way too much ice cream at this very moment, for sure. <laughs> Before dinner. Yeah. Um, so you at the beginning to bring it back around. You you know traveling and doing all the things that you do and uh, you know as you said. Uh, wanting to accomplish things and being hard on yourself and going, going, going. Uh, you also said at the beginning that you can't do this forever. So if you can't do this forever, do you have ideas about what it is that you'll do um, after? I mean, you have the show, you have the Tonight Show. I'm calling it the yeah. Tonight Show, uh, the Josh Gates Tonight Show, which I went on, which was really fun. Oh, it was um, so, great. so, you know, is it transitioning into that or what other things come to mind and, and what kind of timeline do you feel like you can uh, gallivant around the world and, and are you running out of spots to stop at? <laughs> well, definitely not running out of spots to stop at. There's no shortage of mysteries in the world, which is great. I mean, this is one of those things, I don't know, I might be opening a can of worms here because I have questions for you about this too, but it's like, you know, I have such a unique job that it's like, I'm, I'm this travel guy. I've been all over the world. I'm a presenter. I'm a host. I, I could probably do a lot of different things, right? Like, and there are so many things I think I'd like to do. Um, mm. I would like to uh, travel and tell stories and tell different kinds of stories and do different kinds of shows. And uh, I'd love to write more. I'd love to run a travel company. I'd love to lead tours. I'd love to be a teacher. I don't know. I'd love to do a million things. Um, and, and I'm fortunate in that I could probably steer towards some of those things and have a good chance of, of doing them and having them maybe be successful. And that's almost enough rope to hang yourself with because you kind of go, you know, what, what do you do? You, you like, you don't want to do too many things at once because then you kind of end up just in this cloud of like, I'm not really committed to any of these things. And we, we both probably kind of know a little bit what that's like. And, mm -hmm. but I also feel like there's so many things I'm interested in that I don't just want to go down one road and say, that's what I'm going to do. So I don't know is the answer. I mean, I know that, um, 
that I'm pretty good at when the time, when I don't want to do something anymore, I'm pretty good at being like, I'm going to stop doing this. You know, I still have such, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have no qualm being like just putting down the thing and going, that's, that's it. Like I'm good. Like I'm good with this. I'm moving on to something else. Like I can do that and not be too scared of that, you know, but I do feel like I still love what I'm doing. I still love the show and traveling the world. I know that I want to spend more time with my kids in the future. So I know there's another gear I have to find somewhere to allow for that. But I don't know. I mean, this is one of the things I haven't figured out, which is like, I do have this FOMO kind of like, not fear of missing out, but fear of missing opportunity that it's like, yeah, that's a new FOMO. Um, Love that. Right. Yeah. Like, like this, this, this fear of like, Oh, what if I should be doing this other thing right yeah, now? Yeah, like taking the I, opportunities that you have and not let like letting them fall by the wayside just because right. Why? So I don't know. I, I have that kind of thing that that nags at me, but I also kind of feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be and I'm and I'm I love the show and I love my work at Discovery and it's been great. And so I don't know. I think that time will tell. And I I hope that those changes will be apparent for me. Yeah. It's like, oh, I should do this, you know, but maybe they won't be. Maybe it'll be a hard decision to make. What if you did a travel show with your kids? I would love that. Where would, would you take it. them first? Where would you I, take them first? Where's the first like best place to take your kids for a total adventure? Oh. For, ah, just like the coolest place. I don't have kids, I mean, but I know a lot of people that do. I I, so it's tough, right? Like, like kids are little kids, especially my, cause my kids are six and four. They're quite young. They're wowed by, you know, they're wowed by going to a hotel because there's an elevator. You I know, know like, they're like, they're wowed you know, by anything. Indoor right? Water parks are like a thrill. An indoor water park is, is heaven for a child. Yeah. Like that's all they care True. about. You know, I think when my kids are a little older, I would like to take them somewhere that, um, showcases to them kind of like when I was a kid going over to England that the world is a big interesting place with a lot of incredible history to it I mean I I love the idea of vacations that are kind of a fusion of giving kids the stuff they like and the water slide and the pool and all that but also being able to really go somewhere meaningful I love the Yucatan in Mexico for that reason like yeah totally you know, I mean forget Cancun but like you go to a resort for a few days and have a really nice experience and then you could get in a jeep and you could drive a couple hours inland and you can be in the middle of the Maya world and oh yeah see these incredible ruins and I mean Chichen Itza I finally went there this oh, recently amazing. but I mean there's so many cool ruins to see in Mexico for sure. so many so you know it, it'll be something like that and and I, I also you know I'm a big believer not so much with little kids but like I'm a really big believer when it comes to traveling that travel should challenge us on some level you know like I think we are so stressed out about the idea of vacationing and wanting our trips. And I get that. Like we all want to relax and we're all overworked and, and we get in America, we get less vacation time than most industrialized nations. But like, I do think that when you think back on the things that you really remember from traveling, if I said like, what's, you know, if, if you pin someone down and you say, tell me an incredible thing that happened to you when you were traveling, they'll probably tell you about a misadventure. Or something oh, that was like, oh, like definitely. everything went sideways and we Call got caught in a memories. storm. That's what I always do when something goes wrong. It's like <laughs> Haley, who's been with me for so long. She's like, she gave me that line many, 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 many years ago. And she was like making memories. And it is truly what you remember is the shit. That it is wrong. because you're challenged and maybe you're a little scared and you're up against something. So whenever I travel anywhere, it's always, I always, and I always tell people if they're planning a trip, Okay, go on vacation, sit by the pool, do your thing, right? But you got to go every couple days or every or at least once on your trip. You got to do something that scares you, that gets you off the resort, that like you yeah. don't know if you're going to be good at t- whatever it is. Volunteer. You don't know if it's going to be good a, or not. Who cares? Yeah, do see a jungle trek. Take a cooking class. Like I don't know, do something oh where God, you're like going to be challenged by something. Yeah, you know? that's great advice. And that's the only thing you'll remember. It really is like, you know, like I think about, cause I live in LA for most of the year. Like I think about Vegas, right? Like I've been to Vegas a million times because 
you live in LA, it's, you know, it's, it's close, right? So especially when I was first in LA, we would drive out to Vegas all the time, right? We were broke and we, you know, you go for the weekend and get some yeah. cheap, you know, $89 a night uh, hotel somewhere and- um, you, And sleep you, on top of the sheets. <laughs> exactly, um, exactly. But like most of those trips, they all kind of blend together. You know, you're like, you don't really remember any of them because it's just kind of like hanging out and having a good time and drinking and stuff. And that's all great. Like, I'm not against any of that, but like, it doesn't stick to your ribs, right? Like it isn't like meaningful travel. So I just think you can go to the most beautiful place in the world and sit by a pool and in three years, you'll barely be able to remember it. But if you, you know, go on some excursion and get stuck in the mud and have to push your Jeep and, you know, whatever, you'll be talking about it forever. So I want my kids to go to fun places, but I also want them to make memories. I want them to, to like be challenged by stuff, you know? So I don't know. We'll see. Um, they'll, they'll, um, we'll see how much they like pushing a Jeep in the rain. No matter what happens, I guarantee whatever, whatever, whatever does, it will be full of adventure and it will be interesting. You'll make mem many memories and you'll probably, it'll probably be on TV. Maybe, maybe. Well, hopefully. All right. Well, if you're thinking of that show where you want to dive into more spiritual stuff, I've been looking for that moment, that moment someone wants to go travel around and go and really investigate like the spiritual realm. I'm your girl. I love it. I love it. I'm. Hey, I got I got lots of skepticism that you can that you can disabuse me of. Well, it's perfect because you can be like a really Mulder and Scully it, team. And I totally believe in it. So it's right. like the, you know, you know, Wilbon and Kornheiser, you know, you got to have yes. people that like don't agree. Mulder and Scully, I'm ready. We'll do our, we'll, we'll go travel the world and just argue with each other the entire time. <laughs> it sounds like a normal relationship. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. What a, Danica, what it was treat. such a pleasure. I didn't even, I like, to to you. totally had more questions, but who cares? We're going to, we'll, we'll just have to, I, I mean, we'll I was going to ask like boring ones, like what's your favorite place here? And what's the most, this one, and that's not, but I thought we, I think we talked about way more fun stuff. Great. I look forward to the next chat. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.